Welcome to Future Talk. This is the program that examines the global impact of technology and tries to see just where it's leading us. On today's program, we're going to talk about something called the semantic web, which is shaping up to be the next big step in the evolution of the World Wide Web, which will make it a lot more powerful and a lot more omnipresent in our lives than it is today. With me in the studio is our co-host, Jack Porter, who is CEO of Forward Innovations Incorporated, and our special guest, Nova Spivak. Nova Spivak is founder and CEO of Radar Networks Incorporated, which is a pioneer in the development of the semantic web. Nova is a technology entrepreneur and visionary who has been involved in the founding of numerous technology companies, including EarthWeb, which helped major companies like AT&T launch their first large-scale web operations and whose initial public offering in 1998 produced one of the largest first-day gains in NASDAQ history. Nova is a leading-edge thinker with many interests who blogs frequently about those interests and he's also a fan of space tourism, having already flown to the edge of space and experienced weightlessness with the Russian Air Force. Nova, what exactly is the semantic web? Well, uh, the semantic web is really not a new web. It's just a new uh, step in the evolution of the web we already have. And really, if I had to boil it down, uh, it's about making the web smarter. It's, it's about teaching the web to understand the content that's on the web. How would that manifest itself in a practical way? What would I be able to do on it that would be easier than today's web? Probably um, the most noticeable uh, result of a semantic web will be that search will get dramatically better. But there'll be many other uh, manifestations of the technology. Uh, in the enterprise, for example, business intelligence and knowledge management will also improve. Uh, and in fact, the way that we author and share our content and build communities will also change. Are there any technologies that don't exist right now or are coming on the forefront that are really going to drive this? Well, there are, there are a number of technologies that are, that are emerging. Um, they have actually been um, proposed to standards, some are now standards, and these include um, RDF, OWL, uh, and Sparkle, which is a query language, which mm -hmm. allows uh, these kind of database-like searches to take place. In, in a nutshell, we're really turning the web into something that's more like a database and less like a file server. Yeah. Now, where is this ultimately going to lead us? Is this largely for social networking? Is, is there going to be no barriers between time and space? All the information you want in the world is just at your fingertips instantly? Well, you know, the, the goal of, of, of a lot of these technologies is ultimately to enable collective intelligence and artificial intelligence. And I'm sure we'll be speaking about that more today. But um, initially, we'll see, you know, focus uh, taking place around social networks in particular. And, and that's actually what my company has spent some time on in the last couple of years. And then moving more towards search, which is also where we're heading. So uh, the semantic web will really add more meaning to every kind of connection, connections between people as well as connections between information and also between people and information. Why don't we talk a little bit about how we got to this point. We have a slide which shows the evolution of the web. No, actually, I'm sorry. Let's not go to that slide yet. We have another slide which shows some of the relationships, slide number one. Can we see slide number one, please? Okay. So now what is this slide telling us? This slide is really showing um, that the semantic web connects a number of different kinds of things uh, with different kinds of relationships. So you can think of it almost like a language. You know, in language we have nouns, we have verbs, we have these different parts of speech. Well, on the web, you know, we, right now we really only have two things. We have web pages and links. So our vocabulary has essentially two parts of speech. Well, the semantic web is going to add many, many more distinctions. So there will be many kinds of things, not just a web page, but there might be something like a resume or a product listing or a person. These are different kinds of things. Right now, they're just web pages. But imagine if you could mark them up and say, this is a person, this is a product listing, or this is a movie, and that machines could understand that. Similarly, with links, right now there's only one kind of link. But what if there are many kinds of links? A link could say, you know, business partner of, or friend of, or employee of, or competitor of, or product of. So you could do things like Nova is the founder of Twine, and then I can search on any one of those three items. Right. Now, today you could do that, but machines couldn't understand that. Yeah. So, you know, in Facebook, there are different kinds of links already, but they're not machine understandable. Outside of Facebook, other applications can't understand these. Yeah. The semantic web provides a way to add metadata, that is data about data, that's machine understandable. 
So every word has a bunch of other connections. I'm trying to understand what you mean when you say it understands words. Well, it, it can operate at many levels. So let's start at a, a, a sort of higher level. Let's say that you just wanted to mark up uh, a product listing for, let's say, a car. And you have different fields. So first of all, you want to say, what kind of product is it? Well, it's an automobile. So you would, you normally, you would put in a data record, automobile. But applications that don't know what an automobile is won't understand that that's a kind of car. Mm -hmm. So what you do is you actually connect that field with some metadata, little, little invisible codes that don't appear in the browser but do appear to software. Uh, and these codes link that word automobile to, to something called an ontology. And an ontology defines the meaning of terms. So in this case, you'd say automobile links to a special concept for a vehicle, um, in particular uh, a car, in an ontology. And that's, that link is made in such a manner that any application that speaks this language, which is called RDF and OWL, these two languages, any application that speaks that can look up the meaning of that word. Mm -hmm. Similarly for every other field, mileage, model, all of these different things can be defined unambiguously in a machine understandable way. Kind of a Wikipedia for programs. Yeah, so the semantic web is really for software. It's not really for people. Yeah. It allows software to better understand the web. And by doing that, the web gets smarter. Okay, let's talk a little bit about how we got to this point. We have another slide which is titled The Future of Search. Uh, maybe we could see that slide and then you could tell us what it's telling us. Do we have that slide called The Future of Search? There it is. So this slide is really um, looking at decades of innovation. Um, and so we look back towards the sort of end of the PC era and the focus there was really on the front end of the PC, Windows, the Mac interface, trying to make PCs more human understandable. Then we went into the first decade of the web, and there the focus was really on the back end of the web, the core technologies. The front end, the user experience was pretty simple at first. If you remember, there weren't even images in the first browsers. But we gradually advanced. As we get towards web 2.0, which is what we've just been finishing, um, that second decade of the web has really been all about the user experience of the web, making it more like software. Now, uh, you'll also notice that search has changed over time. It used to be directory search on your computer. Then the web came out, and we had Yahoo, which was like a big directory search. And then Google came out with keyword search, and you know, AltaVista and other things before that. But Google really won keyword search. And that's because they made a system that could do uh, web scale keyword search and look, look at the links to try to make use of the links, not just the words. But that is starting to level off. The productivity of keyword search is limited um, as the amount of data continues to increase, because you just get too many results. So what this slide is really showing is that in the third decade of the web, which we've just entered uh, in actually 2009, in the third decade of the web, we're going to go beyond keyword search by adding more semantics to the data. And that means little tags that define the meaning of data so that search engines don't just look at the keywords, but they can also understand the meaning of the data. And so that way, they can filter the results and give you um, less noise. What Google did with page ranking where they said a, a, a document is specifically more important when more documents are pointing at it, will we get that same kind of advantage when we start moving to semantic web? Yeah, I mean, in a way, what Google, Google's big innovation was uh, to find a way to sort of uh, essentially estimate the vote, if you will, of, of a community of parties who are interested in some topic. How many of them voted for a certain page? Mm -hmm. That's kind of what Google's innovation was. And that came, comes from bibliometrics, which actually comes out of library science and has been going on for a long time. Mm -hmm. Google just scaled that to the web. Now, as we go into this next generation, we're looking at other approaches, uh, primarily using social networks to try to uh, get a sense of the value of a piece of content, but more importantly, the reputation of an individual author. And that also applies to the real-time web, where reputation is very important to determining what's, what's valuable. And as we go to the semantic web, it'll take it a level up, because now we'll have the linkages of the web, the social reputation elements of the social web, and finally, linkages to ontologies and other things that define the meaning of the content. And when you combine these different layers, that's when you start to get a very dense matrix that lets you understand the meaning and value of content. Yeah. I understand that you're going to give us a demonstration of the latest version of the semantic web on your laptop, but before we do that, we have a short video which is going to show the increasing role that the web is playing in our lives right now. So could we go ahead and roll that video?
Okay, so that video shows some of the ways in which the web is increasing its presence in our lives. Now, I understand that you're going to give us a demonstration of where your company is right now with the semantic web. What exactly are you going to be showing us? Well, um, I'm going to be showing you uh, an in-house alpha that's never been shown uh, for the next generation of Twine, which is a service we provide uh, based on the semantic web. And in this case, I'm going to be demonstrating semantic search to show you how search might look um, as a semantic web rolls out. So here, um, if we can look at my screen, um, you can see here a simple search box. And I'm going to do a search for something very common, in this case, chicken. So first of all, you'll see standard web results with about 20 million results, just like any other search engine. But these tabs along the top show you different kinds of things that we found that relate to chicken. And obviously, recipes um, are quite relevant. So let's click on recipe. Now we see 69,000 actual chicken recipes. So this isn't you know, millions of things with the word chicken. These are all recipes. There's nothing here that's not a recipe. Now let's decide, let's go down and look for um, you know, particular kinds of options. So let's say we want to find um, gluten-free chicken recipes, for example. Now we found 981. Um, Australian, perhaps. Okay, so now we're down to 23 results. 
and things that take 15 minutes uh, to prepare. Now we're down to 15 different results. Now if we want to go out and look at one of these recipes, I can just click here and go out to the actual recipe. Now the key is that the data on web pages for recipes looks kind of like this. It, doesn't ha it has structure implied, but it doesn't have metadata. So what we're doing is we're actually automatically crawling this data and finding um, related information. And what we do is we connect that data to ontology. So here is a f an ontology in our system. This is the food ontology. And we can go in and look at how we define food. There's many different kinds of things here um, related to food. If we wanted to go in and look at, say, a particular kind of thing like a recipe, I'll just scroll down here um, and we'll look for recipe. This is th a definition of a recipe. And here are the different fields. So it looks a lot like a database. Recipes have things like the amount of cholesterol, dietary options, type of cuisine, and so forth. And these map either to strings or numbers like you'd expect, but also sometimes to other things. So for example, a recipe can have a review. And if you click that, it takes you over to something else called a review. The key is that anybody can define these. Anybody can make these ontologies. They're done with open standards. And so the ontologies exist, or you can make new ones. And then we make these mappings. We crawl and connect things to ontologies and build a semantic index of the web. So how close do we uh, to having this in real life? Well, we do have it in real life. It's just uh, months away. We don't have to completely change all the web pages. This is just the way we index the web pages, correct? correct. Previous approaches to the semantic web assumed that webmasters were going to have to learn a whole new set of skills mm -hmm. uh, related to these languages, RDF and L. That's very difficult. The innovation that we've been pursuing for about nine years is how to automate that. So mm -hmm. we're actually generating this metadata, this RDF and L, automatically for webmasters based on analyzing their pages. Mm -hmm. You know, in this program, we like to look at every aspect of a situation. So let me ask you this. Is there any possible downside to this? We can see the conveniences. But are there any possible drawbacks? For example, is there a risk of being overly dependent on the web so we can't function without it? You know, what if there's a catastrophic system failure? What happens then? Well, I, um, I'm sure you've both seen the Terminator. So <laughs> of course, there's that risk. But I think that's a little bit far out. Um, in a more kind of realistic sense, uh, as humans do increase their dependence on technology, um, we're noticing actual changes in, in the brain. In, if you look at the development of children's brains, they're quite different yeah. than our brains, just based on the fact that they're immersed, for example, in video games. In the, in the case of the web, what we're finding is that since you can find just about anything you need instantaneously, uh, the need to memorize or even really understand things is, is, is decreasing, and we're all becoming generalists. The notion of being a specialist maybe is going away because you can rely on the web to do that. And so I think the web is creating a kind of global brain. And the downside of that is that individuals will be more dependent and perhaps uh, less self-reliant. Um, but the upside, I think, outweighs that, which is that we'll all have access to all of humanity's knowledge. You is, know, loss, oh, is loss of self-reliance a problem? People used to be able to calculate in their heads, and then everybody got calculators. And so, I mean, are we losing something that maybe we'd be better off keeping? I mean, yes, we're, we're, we're definitely losing things. Um, you know, we're losing skills, we're losing um, knowledge, we're losing uh, the kind of rote or even deep understanding um, that the, the earlier educational system used to provide. But we're gaining, I think, access to, you know, unprecedented amounts of knowledge and intelligence, and there's a difference um, all around the world. And so what, what's happening is maybe the, the role of the individual is going to shift. Uh, individuals might become less important um, but collectives will become more important and more intelligent. Do you think there's been a big bifurcation against people who knew how to use computers and leverage the computers against people who couldn't? Is that going to expand with this new technology or is that actually going to contract? It's a good question. I mean, I, I think there's probably nobody, um, you know, today in the younger generations um, that isn't fluent with computers. So yeah. uh, I don't think it'll be a problem, at least in um, developed countries. Uh, I think we'll see some people. Um, I among the uh, elderly who may not be as fluent, um, but that's you know going to rapidly change in 20 years. There probably won't be many people yeah. um, who aren't quite fluent uh, in the developed world. I think where we we're going to see a big bifurcation is in developing countries where their principal mode of access is on mobile devices um, with very different screen real estate, and so a lot of the kinds of things we do on the web, um, which involve a lot of typing and scrolling around, they don't that doesn't work on a phone. Is it possible that the web will act as an accelerant to conflicts? There are many conflicts in the world, and conflicts used to be in slow motion because it took a long time for a message to get from one place to another. Uh, is the web going to make all those differences go away, or will it just sharpen them? 
I think um, you know the web is really speeding everything up. Um, you know, there's this big trend now called the re called the real time web. I call it the less time web because we all have less time. <laughs> um, but everything's going faster. The notion of the now is changing. It's getting shorter. So where the now used to be maybe a day, you know, in business or in politics, now it's it, you know it moved up to hours in the in the 80s and in, in the 90s. You know, it was you know down to the half hour, and now we're the now is really you know measured in minutes. Mm -hmm. We have another slide which shows some of the things we might expect in the future. Uh, maybe we could take a look at that slide and you can explain what it is and then we'll get into some additional topics about artificial intelligence and collective intelligence and where this seeming implosion of consciousness is really leading us. So this slide really talks about um, a future outlook for how semantic technologies, which are technologies that are all about understanding the meaning of content, how these technologies are rolling out. And really, from 2007 through 2009, that was the very early adoption phase where some of the first companies came out. Um, my company with Twine, um, another company, MetaWeb, made a product called Freebase, Adaptive Blue, and, and several other uh, companies have come out with products that sort of brought these out for the first time. And now Reuters has gone, come on board. Uh, so there's a bunch of companies in the space. Uh, from 2010 to really 2020, that's where mainstream adoption happens. That's where we see major companies, major online services really adopting th these technologies. And that's actually starting now. Um, and we're involved in a number of those initiatives. And then as we get out into 2020, what I call the fourth decade of the web, Web 4.0, uh, the next big cycle begins. And that's all about reasoning and intelligence. And that's enabled by the fact that by then, the content on the web will be machine understandable. Applications will be able to start to reason against that content. In trying to make computers more intelligent, do we get more insight into human intelligence? Because I think human intelligence is one of the least understood things, one of the least penetrated by science. So we understanding ourselves better by trying to teach machines to be intelligent. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, the, the old um, sort of Asian view um, that the microcosm and the macrocosm sort of reflect each other. I think we're going to see that mm -hmm. um, with the web, where the web is developing and it's going to use solutions that nature found in the brain to develop the brain. And it's happening very quickly, where the brain took, you know, hundreds of millions or billions of years, depending on how you look at it. The web will evolve high levels of intelligence, probably in a time scale of hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. And we will start to see structures in the web that mimic the structures in the brain. We're already starting to, to start to, to piece these together. And there's a new field of web science that's actually looking at that very closely. Do you think this could actually lead to something like machine consciousness, or will it always be just a simulation of intelligence? Well, uh, you know, Ray Kurzweil and, and people who believe in what's called the technological singularity um, believe that the, you know, the acceleration of technology is leading us to a point around 2020 to 2030 in that time frame where uh, machines will become so intelligent we can't understand them and then they'll become conscious. They believe that consciousness is really just a function of complexity. I, however, do not believe that. I think that there's a big difference between intelligence and consciousness. Intelligence is the, is the ability to do you know, meaningful, seemingly smart things with data. Uh, but consciousness is something quite different. That's, that's the, the ability to know what's going on, to really understand what's appearing. You know, you, a machine can understand words and interpret a sentence, but does it really understand what it's saying or reading? That's an interesting question. I don't believe so, but it's a philosophical difference. You know, I think one of the things that's happened back in the 80s when we tried to get to artificial intelligence is we'd get it going, and as soon as it started to expand, we'd blow our computer. Our computers couldn't deal with that kind of um, uh, data going through it. Now with the clouds, is that going to change? I mean, are we going to be able to have just this mass computing system that we can really bring something to bear that we've never had before? Yeah, the cloud computing, um, this notion of, you know, tying together and leveraging, you know, literally millions of computers all over the web, um, is going to introduce something new. It's, it's a level of computing and a, and a style of computing that we've never seen before. And, and that may create the platform on which true artificial intelligence can emerge. But will it be conscious? I doubt it. Mm -hmm. I think the consciousness is us. Mm -hmm. Now, you've been somewhat involved with collective intelligence. Uh, are we talking about just close collaboration with instant access to information? Or are we talking about some kind of biological process where something changes in human beings that makes them you know, more receptive to other people or more perceptive? So collective intelligence, um, will, in my view, will be a combination of machine intelligence and human intelligence working together. And I think that it will go through many phases. And we have a form of it right now with services like Twitter. Mm 
which are kind of collective intelligences. Um, but as, as this goes further, there will be applications which specifically facilitate groups to be smarter, sort of beyond groupware. These are services that really help groups become intelligent and that learn from groups. And then beyond that, as we actually have brain-machine interfaces, which exist in the lab today, um, which connect your nervous system directly to computers um, in both directions, uh, that will actually change us physically. As the web develops, is there going to be somebody in charge of it, somebody who controls it, someone who determines what can be on the web, what can't be on the web? Well, I certainly hope not. <laughs> um, I, I think that the web is, is designed um, with, with enough built-in chaos that it will be impossible for anybody to control um, from the top level. Where there is some vulnerability is not really the web, but the Internet itself. Um, there, there are a number of choke points in the, in the architecture of the Internet, and those are controlled by governments. So you know, we need to make sure there are more uh, ways to route around those kinds of obstacles. The Internet tends to get around things like that. We saw that happen in Iraq, you yeah. know, when it, things went on. They locked it down, but sure enough, it all got out, too. Yeah, and I'm hoping that people will invent um, unblockable forms of Internet access to yeah. help with that. Well, people are going to be using the web to advance their own personal agendas, whatever they may be. Um, you know, it's been said that you could make up a lie and it'll be halfway around the world before the truth even knows what's going on. I mean, is there, is there a chance that with the speed of communication, the web can be used as a means of disinformation as well as a means of information? Yeah, we, we see that happening all the time with, mm -hmm. with spam and, and phishing and, and many other um, abuses of the web. But uh, as we get uh, semantics which understand content and social networks which look at reputation, we'll have new ways of filtering that out. We are just about out of time, so we are going to have to wrap the show. I'd like to thank my co-host, Jack okay. Porter, my special guest, Nova Spivak. Thank you very much for thank all you. your insights. We enjoyed it. I think you enlightened our audience a bit. This is Marty Wasserman. Be sure to tune in for the next episode of Future Talk. See you again next time. <laughs>